Well, 703, so I'd like to start up. Thank you, everybody, for coming to Wednesday night at the lab. Um, I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension, 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday night at the lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year by Zoom. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Karina Berger. Uh, she's with the uh, neurology department. Um, I'm going to ask her the five questions that I ask everybody. Uh, Karina, where were you born? I was born in Madrid, Spain. And where'd you go to the equivalent of high school? Uh, so that was in, in Spain also in Madrid. It was, the, it was a, a, a Jesuit uh, Catholic school. Um, and, uh, yeah. Very good. And then, uh, where'd you go for your undergrad and what did you study? So I went to the university of Colorado at Denver and I was a major in chemistry and double major in chemistry and biology. And for your master's or PhD? Uh, for my PhD. So, um, my thesis at my undergraduate advisor, when I asked her, what should I look for in grad school? She said the weather. So I stayed in Denver uh, where we have, you know, 350 days of sun and, you know, I enjoy skiing. So, you know, I stay there for my PhD. So in American football, that's what we call a 15 yard penalty for taunting. <laughs> and uh, did you do any postdocs? Um, yeah, I did a, a postdoctoral fellowship in, uh, in SUNY Stony Brook. Oh, good, good, good. And then how long have you been at Madison? Um, 13 years. Very so good. actually, this is the longest I've lived in one place in the United States since I've been an adult. I lived 12 years in Colorado. So now oh. it's one more year in Madison. So, you know, just this is the longest I've lived in one place in, in the States. Yep. Well, I'm fond of saying we have better ice fishing than Boulder. So... <laughs> Well, thank you for coming tonight. You're gonna to talk to us about Use It or Lose It, the role of environmental enrichment and cognitive aging. I uh, hope everybody will join me in welcoming Professor Karina Berger to Wednesday night at the lab, and then you can go ahead and uh, take it away whenever you'd like. So I basically, um, oops, how do I, oh, hold on. Um, so again, you know, I'm going to repeat it a little bit, but, you know, I was born in, in Madrid, Spain, and that's uh, where I grew up. And I moved to the States when I was 20. Um, and uh, the reason I, I mean, I known I wanted to be a neuroscientist, well, a scientist since I was a little kid. I mean, when my parents told me, wash your hands, you had, you know, germs. And I was like, oh, cool, you know, and I wanted to, to look at them and stuff. And I uh, was doing experiments in the bathroom where I would mix all, you know, the, the soap with the, you know, shampoo and with the, you know, and make experiments. But anyway, uh, my hero in terms of becoming a neurosciences was my countryman, Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who was a very multifaceted uh, scientist. Uh, not only he was an amazing um, anatomist, and uh, also, as you can see, he made amazing drawings of the different cells and regions of the brain, but he was also interested in photography. He developed a lot of staining techniques for that. And actually, because you know, of, he, of these staining techniques, he also learned how to stain uh, and, uh, neurons. Uh, he was also interested in um, hypnotism. So he actually, had people and he just kind of experimented with them, which I, I'm sure that right now wouldn't be that that uh, that cool. But um, his claim to fame is that he got the Nobel Prize for discovering that uh, neurons had um, you know had synapses. So before that, uh, actually Camillo Golgi and others thought that the nervous system was like a web. It was just these you know, like a spider web all over our body. And he said, no, no, they're individual cells and they're connected by this thing that's called the synapse. And that's where all, you know, all the action is going on. So basically uh, what he showed is that, for, listen, imagine that this is a, a neuron in your skin, it's a sensory neuron. 
and then you know you get pinch and so then the this this neuron sends uh, an action potential which is basically uh, you know an electrical signal that then uh, is received at these can you see my my arrow Move it. Okay. So anyway, so this is the area where then uh, this uh, electrical activity causes the release of neurotransmitters, which can be amino acids or peptides or hormones. And, uh, and so then these uh, neurotransmitters, they bind to receptors in the neuron, in the next neuron in line. And so then what happens is that uh, the signal gets transmitted and then you get that electrical signal moving to the next uh, cell and so on and so forth. And so then eventually that signal comes into the brain and tells you, I got pinched, you know, or like I got stabbed with a, with a needle or something. Uh, so anyway, uh, before I start uh, talking, my, I mean, I, I know you know, when I, I just wasn't sure what my audience was by, by uh, giving the talk at uh, Plato, I realized that you guys uh, have much more background knowledge that, um, that I know. So, but anyway, um, before I go into that, I mean, I, I already told that, it's just that I started my, my trip, you know, I was in Madrid. What happened is I started chemistry in Madrid and then I told my um, biology teacher in my first year as a freshman that I wanted to work in a lab. And he says, no, people don't work in labs until your fifth year because over there are, you know, you get a degree after five years. And uh, as a senior thesis, and I'm like, and, but, but, you know, you're such a good student, you can watch. And it's like, I don't wanna watch, I wanna do. So I went to uh, University of Colorado because, you know, I said the only place where you can do research and get funding and things like that is the US, so I'm gonna go to the US. So then I, when I finished, then I moved to Stony Brook and over there I actually studied epigenetics, which is actually changes that happen in the DNA within, you know, like uh, your lifetime. It's not like a genetic change um, that, you know, uh, that happens via, um, you know, your common genetics when you pass your genes along to your progeny. Uh, but I was, you know, then I was just studying tissue culture and I wanted to learn. I mean, I've always, because of Ramonica Hall and I've always been interested in learning a memory. So I, um, I decided to go to the University of Florida in Gainesville where I learned um, animal behavioral tasks, learning a memory tasks, uh, learn to work with rats and teach them, you know, learning things. And, uh, but I also learned a uh, viral gene delivery. And uh, that's from the father of adeno associated virus. And uh, that was very useful because uh, it was a really interesting way to, you know, question um, neuroscience, you know, uh, biological questions. So, but I'll talk about that later. And then over there was a research assistant professor, which is basically a non-tenure track position. And so finally, I got a tenure track position here at Madison, and I'm super happy. I love Madison a lot, and I love the university. It's a fantastic place where I have a lot of collaborators. So anyway, before I go into my talk, I know that most of you know about the central dogma, which is that, you know, DNA codes for you know the makeup of uh, genes and uh, these uh, the way oops, sorry the the way this uh, works is that DNA gets uh, transcribed into messenger RNA and I know a lot of people are he hearing right now about RNA because of the COVID vaccines um, and uh, these RNAs the way I like to see it is that the DNA is has all the information about the building blocks of the cells. And then the messenger RNA is like making photocopies. So let's say that, you know, because right now there's, I don't know how many of you, but let's say there's 40 of you. So I need to make 40 uh, photocopies of a certain, you know, the talk that I'm giving today. Uh, and then um, if I need less, I make less. And so that's what happens. And so depending on how much RNA you make, then 
uh, that makes into how much protein or less protein. And so this is how the cells are regulated. And disease happens where there's a misregulation of this transcription or translation, and you're making either too little or too much. And so the reason I'm bringing this up is because I want to talk a lot about transcription and, and protein expression. So uh, what I'm interested in is uh, the mechanisms of learning and memory in aging and neurodegeneration. And um, in our lab, we use rats as a model because rats, like humans, when they get older, they are either, you know, they can either learn as good as young rats or you know, all the way they have like a range of cognitive ability that goes all the way to being completely learning impaired. And so that's kind of resembles what's called mild cognitive impairments associated with aging in humans. Um, and so because my background is in molecular biology, I, my hypothesis was that those differences between these two extreme groups of animals that could learn, age animals that could learn or, or could not learn, was uh, due to differences in transcription of genes important for learning a memory. And so in order to uh, uh, prove my uh, hypothesis, I just perform a genomic um, screening where, uh, so basically what I did is I took eight rats and I trained them in this, it's called the water, the Morris water maze, and I'll explain how it works uh, later. And so I basically was able to segregate eight rats into learning impaired and learning unimpaired. And uh, then I isolated uh, the, hypo the hippocampus of these animals because I'm interested in the hippocampus because uh, it's an area that's important for the acquisition, I don't know what is going back, for the acquisition of um, memory and also um, is an area that's vulnerable to the effects of aging and Alzheimer's disease. And uh, one thing I want to point out is like um, all my students ask, what are these weird names like hippocampus, substantia nigra, uh, striatum? And the anatomists in past centuries, they had a lot of imagination. And so uh, hippocampus actually in Greek means, um, now, oh, sorry, my pointer is not working. Uh, hippocampus means a seahorse. And what you can see in the right is the seahorse and in the left is that dissected human uh, hippocampus. And so that's, you know, you can say, but anyway, um, so we dissected the hippocampus of these two groups of rats, and then they, we isolated the messenger RNA. And then what we do is we label them with a fluorescent tag. So then uh, we can interrogate these uh, rat uh, genome um, microarrays that um, they're, they look actually, they're the size of a domino, and they actually contain the entire rat genome in it. So basically, when you interrogate with these fluorescent label, it will bind to those genes in the rat, and then you can decipher which ones are active or not. And then well, we just do some analysis and we figure out which ones are real learning and memory genes. And so after doing that, we found 50 genes that were differentially uh, transcribed in animals that were superior learners versus superior inferior learners. And today I'm just going to talk about one of them. And um, that one is uh, Homer 1. So Homer 1 is a protein that is present in the synaptic density that I talk about. And it's actually placed in the uh, uh, postsynaptic density. And it binds to these receptors that I was talking about uh, that are important for um, um, the transmission of information for um, consolidating memories. And uh, the messenger RNA that we found, so Homer 1, was actually uh, downregulated in animals that could not learn. And so, uh, you know, once you do these kind of genomic studies, the first thing you have to do to implicate the gene in learning a memory is to knock it out. So if this gene was downregulated in age learning impaired rats, 
we could take a rat that's normally learning, if we remove this gene or knock it out, this animal would be dumb, right? And so someone have actually done this um, experiment and they had make a knockout um, mouse model of Homer one. And they actually do show uh, learning deficits. And um, sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't, I don't know why. Okay, so, um, so we know that age learning impaired rats have hippocampal learning deficits, as I mentioned, but what, you know, these Homer knockout mice, they're only missing one gene. So it's, you know, it makes sense, but these other animals are um, missing 50 genes. As I told you, they're misregulated. So would it be, a, if we put back just this one gene, would we able to, you know, restore memory in these, in these age animals? Uh, or, you know, in other words, is can we make smart rats, uh, age rats? And the answer is, um, oh, my, hold on. Uh, I just made the, yes, we can. I just made my thing is not working very well. Anyway, um, so now I'm gonna, um, step back a little bit and explain what's gene therapy because this is a, a technique that I use. And so the gene therapy is the use of DNA as a drug to treat disease uh, by delivering uh, therapeutic DNA into a patient cells. And so uh, DNA can be uh, a therapeutic gene. So in the case of uh, hemophilia is by replacing the clot, clotting factor nine. And this, uh, there are clinical trials going on right now, and they're being very um, spectacular because uh, people who needed weekly transfusions of blood, now they don't anymore. Um, another thing is if uh, DNA that corrects some mutations. So in the case of Huntington gene, there's these repeats that keep expanding. And so if you can um, delete these expansions, then you could correct the disease. And in the case of neurological disorders, you know, these genes have to be delivered into the brain um, by using these uh, viral vectors. And so I'm going to talk about the most commonly used uh, viral vectors. Um, the first one is adenovirus. Uh, this is a large uh, double-stranded DNA virus. And uh, you might be familiar because it causes these nasty calls that you know cause conjunctivitis. And uh, but uh, more recently is being used by um, Johnson and Johnson to generate the COVID vaccine. So basically, the way the um, genetic material coding for the spike protein of COVID is inside this um, these adenovirus. So then the adenovirus goes into your body, comes into a cell, delivers the, uh, the COVID spike uh, DNA, gets transcribed, translated into protein, then the immune system recognizes that you're making a foreign gene and then you uh, develop antibodies. Uh, the next one is uh, herpes simplex virus. This is a large gene is a very, very large uh, virus and um, is the one that causes cold sores. And so basically in all these, uh, I don't know what's going on with my uh, thing, but anyway, um, in the case of uh, these, um, we call them viral vectors because basically we remove all the toxic or pathogenic genes in it and we just have enough of the genes that they can still make a capsid and, uh, and have the DNA where you can put your, your gene of interest, but um, they're supposed to be non-pathogenic. And so uh, these are not just the wild type viruses, they're just uh, recombinant. They're, um, you know, we kind of um, control their, their reproduction and replication. Then the lentivirus is another very widely used and actually is, um, is basically the, the virus for HIV. And it's also been uh, crippled, so it cannot cause HIV. And then you can use it to um, you know, express uh, your genes of interest. And finally, the one that I, I'm gonna focus on is adeno-associated virus. This is the smallest of them. 
is a single-stranded uh, DNA virus. And right now it's kind of like the golden child for gene therapy because unlike the other viral vectors, it doesn't have, the Y-type doesn't have any pathogenic effects. And so it's been used in a number of gene therapy uh, clinical trials. Okay, so um, why do we use viral gene delivery? I mean, now you see that with COVID, you can just put, you know, uh, genetic material in a lipid uh, substrate, and then the lipid will bind to the lipid membrane and get in. Well, uh, viruses have evolved over millions of years to do exactly that. And so they bind specifically to, to cell receptors and they're very efficient at delivering genetic material. And even though liposomes, you know, they're getting better and people are working into that. And obviously they, um, these, these viral vectors are inc incredibly um, efficient in doing that. So basically what happens is that the, uh, the virus, the viral vector, um, uh, binds to a specific cell receptor. And you know, for example, COVID, which is the wild type virus, uh, binds to these IC2 receptors. And then and the, the viruses enter the cell, they uncoat to release the genetic material, which could be DNA or RNA. And then if it's DNA goes into the nucleus and gets transcribed into RNA and the RNA gets transcribed into protein and so on. So that's... Uh, that's the deal. So as I said, these viral vectors need to be injected into the brain when, you know, we're doing gene therapy or, in or to study any, uh, you know, learning a memory or other uh, neuroscience questions that we might have. And so we, we actually carry out these very um, uh, precise and minimally invasive injections and uh, we have coordinates for the exact uh, brain area that we want to inject. And so uh, when we do that, um, this is basically the kind of thing you see. So in the experiments that I'm gonna talk about, uh, we're gonna have uh, a viral vector, so adeno-associated virus or AEV, that is gonna code for the Homer gene. And so then uh, we do an injection using uh, these coordinates because we have maps of the brain so we know exactly where we're injecting. And so then the, the virus goes, enters the cell, and then um, the DNA uh, starts turning, you know, transcribing into messenger RNA and then the messenger RNA uh, translates into protein. And so then we get this Homer protein expressed in the area of the brain that we're interested in. And so this works for like the um, research experiments we do, but this is also what people are using uh, in gene therapy to treat uh, Alzheimer's, Huntington and uh, Parkinson's disease. So here what I'm showing is the uh, area of the brain of a rat is the, the a mouse, I'm sorry, is the hippocampus and um, this is a Homer knockout animal that is not expressing anything in the brain because the gene has been knocked out. And so we injected it, we injected it into the hippocampus and you can see that this is where uh, Homer one is expressed, which is very much like what's supposed to look uh, in a wild type animal. And uh, we always have to use a control to show that it's not just that we made a hole in the brain or that we injected something that's affecting. And so we use um, green fluorescent protein or GFP. And we get a different distribution because those different proteins, they go to different parts of the cell. So once we do that, um, then uh, what I'm gonna show you is how the results we got when we did that in um, age learning impaired rats. So I, I told you before that, does anybody have a question? I heard a, no, okay. So as I told you before, HRATs, they can be categorized into uh, learning impaired or learning unimpaired. And so what we first have to do is um, test no, them. You had too much to drink already. You have a beer. I you wish I had a beer. <laughs> 
It will be good. It won't be good. I need a beer. Anyway, um, so anyway, so A threats, we first need to characterize them into learning impair or learning and impair. And so we use um, what's called the object location memory task, which I'll explain in a minute. And so when uh, we do that, and then we take the animals that are impaired, and then half of them, we inject them with a gene that's supposedly uh, gonna make them smarter or with a control, uh, with is the GFP control. And then um, we wait a couple of weeks to make sure that the virus enters the cell, the DNA is transcribed, and then um, it makes protein. And then we retest them again in the same test, which is the object location memory task. And then another test, which is the Morris water maze. And we do that because um, we want to have two different independent tests. And so I want to explain what the object location memory test is. So basically we put the rats in an arena that has uh, two identical objects. And so the animals, you know, you, they get there, they're curious, they're going to explore and they're going to realize the objects are identical. And so they're going to spend about 50, 50 in each object. And so then the next day, what we do is we move one of the objects uh, to a different location. And uh, if an animal is unimpaired and he can learn perfectly, he'll recognize that the object has been moved and he'll spend a significant amount of time exploring this novel location. And you might say, well, who cares if you know you move the 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 the, anim the, the place? And but you know, these rats need to remember when they're located, uh, their food, like when they buried their nuts and things like that. And so uh, for them, it's kind of important. And then we also have a similar one where we have the two identical objects. And then the second day, we just um, replace one object uh, by a different one. And it's called the uh, novel object recognition task. So we use those. Uh, then, uh, the Morris water maze is a test uh, where uh, animals are placed in a big water tank and um, rats are swimmers. I mean, they're, they're aquatic animals. And actually when, if you have to be careful not to overtrain them because then they don't want to come out of the water. They love, you know, swimming around. So uh, in, uh, I cannot, my, my pointer sometimes doesn't work. But anyway, there's on the left, uh, quadrant. Oh, there you go. Okay. On this quadrant, there's a hidden platform submerged. And so the animal, we place them in different uh, corners and we drop them in the water and then they have to swim around until they find the platform. Initially, they might not find it because they don't know what the task is all about. And so if they don't find it, we just place them there so they get their bearings and they're like Northwest, East, South. And eventually, uh, no matter where you drop them, they'll find um, the location. So that's a measure of how they learn and then uh, after the training, then uh, we remove that platform and then uh, it's called the probe trial. This pointer is just uh, defective. But anyway, uh, we remove the, the, um, the platform. And so the animal will spend time saying, where did you put, I know it was here. I'm pretty sure it was here. What did you do with it? And so uh, we measured that amount of times they crossed where the platform used to see as a measure of, um, you know, uh, how well the animal learned. And so these are the results for the uh, object location memory task where we uh, place, uh, change the location. So this is, uh, has a lot of information, so I'm gonna explain it. So, um, let me get here. So OLM1 is object location memory task before treatment. Uh, OLM2 is after treatment, after we injected them with the viral vector expressing Homer 1C. Next to it is OLM1 and OLM2 for um, GFP, which is a control. And then next is um, OLM1 and OLM2 for the young animals. 
Now, 50% uh, means that the animals uh, really didn't spend a significant amount of time exploring the novel location. If they did, it would have been above 50%. So uh, as you can see in all M1, so before treatment, the age impaired animals spend like about like an average of, an average of 50% uh, exploring the novel location. So then after we do the injection of Homer 1C, what you can see is the animals injected with Homer 1C, they significantly improve and spend a significant amount recognizing that the object had been moved. Whereas the animals injected with GFP did not. And finally, we had a you know, group of young animals that were not treated, but you know, we always use them as a control for how awesome young people are at remembering things. And you can see they're all like doing uh, very well. Okay, to, just to summarize the, this part, uh, I think I, sh I convinced you that, you know, when we deliver Homer 1C to the hippocampus of aging bear rats, they can improve performance on these object location me, uh, memory task. And uh, we see, uh, I haven't shown the results of in the Morris water maze uh, for sake of time, but they also uh, show some improvement. So, um, so that was uh, the beginning of uh, trying to, you know, try to improve uh, cognitive um, ability in a tracks. But uh, at this time I had a new grad student and she was like, well, you know, this is awesome, but I don't think that many people would like to have a whole drill in their brain to become smarter. So I would like to try something that would be less uh, invasive. And I would like to try environmental enrichment. And so we know that environmental enrichment improves uh, cognitive ability both in animals and in humans. And, but we don't understand what's happening at the cellular molecular level. And so um, in, the, um, in the rat models, people, what they use is these uh, cages that have a lot of toys. They have igloos, they have tunnels, they have nesting material. And, you know, we change the, the toys uh, twice a week to maintain novelty. Um, most people just, when they do enrichment studies, then they compare them to the animals that are usually uh, housed in a standard cage with two rats. But we figured that here we're adding uh, too many variables, including the fact that instead of two rats, they have six rats. And what about if it's just enough to have a bunch of bodies uh, around you? And so we included this other group where, you know, there's six animals in a big cage, but there's no toys. And then finally, the control, like I told you, is that the standard cage rats where, you know, there's only two rats in the cage. And if we want to compare these, make an analogy or a proxy for what, you know, this would be humans would be um, in the environmental and rich would be humans who are both intellectually and socially engaged. In this one, it would be just social engagement, just meeting your friends, you know, for a drink or something. And finally, the uh, standard gauge would be, you know, the, you know, couch potatoes. And so uh, the first thing we did is we tested the animals in a number of uh, behavioral tasks. And um, what uh, here I'm showing the results in the Morris water maze. And um, so, I mean, um, people have shown that environmental enrichment improves behavior in rodents. So this is nothing uh, in particular. So uh, here what we show is that uh, both socially enriched and environmentally enriched, they, they reach the platform in the Morris Water Mage much uh, faster. And then, uh, but the enriched rats, they improve uh, in terms of the number of crossings when we remove the platform. And then when we do the novel object, uh, task, uh, environmentally and rich animals do significantly better than both social and standard cage animals. So that was fine. And like I said, other people have shown this, but we wanted to see what happens at the cellular level. And again, my, uh, let me get my, 
Okay, so uh, in order to do this, um, the way to we, the, the, what we think is the cellular correlates of learning is called synaptic plasticity. And so um, we stood, there's several types of uh, synaptic plasticities, long-term potentiation, long-term depression. And so here, what I'm showing is a uh, 400 micron uh, hippocampal slice uh, from a rat. And then um, there's three regions. There's the CA1, there's the CA3 and the dentate. And so uh, these uh, neurons here, you can see here, they make a connection to the CA1, which is where we found Homer. So this is the synapse that we're interested in studying. So what we did in these animals is that basically what you do, well, no longer animals, they're slices, but we can keep them alive for um, 12, 24 hours. And so what we do is in these neurons over here, we place a stimulating electrode and then uh, we send uh, you know, a stimulus and then we record from these neurons over here on the other side of the synapse. And so basically uh, when uh, we start by giving a small pulse and just to make sure that our slices are um, alive. And so basically this is an action potential and you're probably familiar with action potentials when you see your electroencephalocardiograms. Uh, and this is basically, you know, the cells just, you know, sending signals. And so we make sure that the cells are alive. Then we hit them with a set of high stimulus uh, frequency stimulation. And then uh, we record the response. And so what we see that happens is that uh, there's a change in the initial slope of the action potential. And so we measure this difference and this is what you see in here is basically the change in the slope, which is called the field excitatory postsynaptic potential. And so um, you would think that when, you know, after the stimulus is done, that the cells uh, activity would decay, but no, they, um, they remember that they've been stimulated. And so that's what we call it long-term potentiation. And this is how we think uh, that's happened uh, in, uh, at the cellular level when we learn something. Uh, because I told you I'm interested in Homer and Homer interacts with the cellular receptors. And one of them is this uh, metabotropic glutamate receptor five. Uh, we use a similar kind of stimulation paradigm, but what we do, and again, I'm going back there. Uh, is, okay. What we do is we give a soft threshold stimulation. So I show you before that when we give these uh, high stimulation paradigms, we get long-term potentiation, but this soft threshold one results in a decaying uh, slope. So basically short-term potentiation. But if we add an agonist to this um, metabotropic glutamate receptor, um, then actually we can turn this uh, short-term potentiation into uh, long-term potentiation. And I hope I haven't lost you by now because the, you know, um, the fun line comes soon. Uh, basically what I'm trying to say is that um, this is called the molecular switch uh, of these uh, glutamate receptors. But anyway, so this happens when we do it in uh, standard rats or in um, standard cage rats or in uh, uh, socially enriched rats. So then we do the same soft threshold stimulation into environmentally enriched rats. And what we find is that these rats, they already uh, can produce long-term potentiation without an agonist that binds to that receptor. So that was pretty impressive because it seems that these um, neurons are primed. And if we add the agonists, they don't get any better. They're already like primed. So I think the reason they're this smart is because they already have something in there that uh, is, is primes them to receive like a minimal signal to uh, consolidate memories.
So in conclusion, uh, you know, we found this gene that is Homer 1C, that's important for learning and memory formation, and that is expressed in the, at low levels in age learning impaired rats. And that we we add this gene into these knock-on mice or these age learning impaired rats, we can improve uh, learning and memory ability. And then finally, that environmental enrichment uh, enhances learning and memory and synaptic plasticity. And we've shown this both in young and age rats. And uh, what I have to say is that what's interesting is that um, we've taken age rats and we only did the enrichment uh, for one month. And we saw these very um, significant changes. So basically the take home message is that it's never uh, too late to uh, increase you know, new connections in your brain. And uh, right now what we're working on is that uh, we figure out the biochemical pathways that happen inside of the cell. And so um, what we think is something primes these environmentally enriched um, neurons to activate this uh, metabotropic glutamate receptor pathway. So it binds to Homer, and then it activates both these, it's called the extracellular receptor kinase and the mammalian target of rapamycin. This mTOR pathway, uh, some of you might have heard because they're using it to increase uh, aging. Uh, they're using it actually as a drug to increase aging. And so uh, these two pathways act in conjunction to increase protein synthesis at the synapse uh, to, uh, of genes that uh, are important for learning and memory. Um, and so basically now we're going uh, to try to explore this environmental enrichment in animals that, um, in, in models of Alzheimer's disease and uh, Parkinson's disease. And so um, before I ask, uh, I answer any questions, I would like to acknowledge all the uh, people in the lab that work for it and all the funding that we receive to carry out uh, these experiments. And so now I will take questions. Thank you very much. Uh, what we do is, um, what we do is go back and forth between a stated question and a chat question. Okay. And uh, if anybody would like to state a question or to write a chat question, that would be great. Bia will be helping me with this. Um, let's see. And you can go ahead and unmute if you have a question to ask. Um, if it's all right, I'll start off, Karina, with asking, is there any foreseeable in the human situation <clears throat> Is there any foreseeable blood test or other physiological test for these kinds of factors? And you'd be able to say, yes, persons have um, this particular stuff um, and be able to track whether they're responding to the environmental enrichment beyond the tests of cognition that you'd be able to do with them. Um. So you're asking for, for checking if this molecule, if these genes are upregulated or not, or? Yeah, or if there's some other um, proxy uh, so that you wouldn't have to take a biopsy, but if you'd be able to yeah. um, detect yeah. that in blood or urine or something like that. Yeah, so um, those are things that, that we're working on. We, uh, I mean, we just, actually we did get um, autopsy uh, hippocampal tissue from um, patients, Alzheimer's, you know, um, patients and, and age match controls. And it seemed that, I mean, we still don't have any significant data because we didn't have that much, but uh, it seemed that uh, Homer 1C, this particular form was um, actually uh, downregulated in Alzheimer's. And so, um, like you said, we cannot just take a biopsy or whatever. So. The next step uh, is to look into um, cerebral spinal fluid. And, um, you know, like you said, you, I mean, urine would be harder. I, I don't know. I mean, right now, there's a lot of uh, studies where they're finding these. Uh, I don't know if people have, probably you guys have heard about exosomes, but um, 
these exosomes travel through the uh, cerebral spinal fluid and also in the periphery. And people are looking for these um, different genes in terms of Alzheimer's and um, other things, but we, we still haven't, uh, haven't done that. Um, but we're definitely right now, like looking at uh, changes due to environmental enrichment through the lifetime. And we're gonna start a study where um, we're also looking, because one of the things that has been shown is that educational attainment um, slows down um, the effects of Alzheimer's disease and cognitive aging. And so we're gonna look at several markers um, in, in several um, patients and also see if what we see in the imaging compares to what we see in, in, in rats. Sounds good. And then Bia, would you like to read um, one of the questions from the chat? Yeah, I can do that. So Sandy Rotter asked of a paper. Do you see that in the in the chat? Yeah, okay, so which, uh, let's see, I see, uh, okay, let me start. And why people from Stoughton are tough. <laughs> I think that was from our, uh, our English as a second language conversation. Yeah. Stuffton, Tufton. Uh, so could you use a photoreceptor? I think you're, um, you're probably asking about the optogenetic things. Yeah, so um, people are using these optogenetic uh, tools in order to uh, study connections. And yes, absolutely. Uh, I personally don't have the technical ability to do that, but fortunately, there's many people on campus that that do it, and you know, we're always looking for uh, collaborations. Uh, but definitely, yes. I mean, um, right now, I'm evaluating a bunch of grants, and everybody's using optogenetics. Um, and so every time I give a talk, I said, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not going to talk about optogenetics. I, I don't do that. But everybody, you know, is, I think the guy who invented it, um, he's from Stanford, is going to get the Nobel Prize because there's so many, um, we've learned so much about connections using that, that technology. But anyway, so uh, any ideas as to what might cause the loss of gene expression that produces the Homer gene? I wish, I mean, that's my next step. I mean, um, actually, so what's interesting is that if you look at aging versus young, like at baseline, uh, there's no changes in expression of Homer, is when you're learning. So this is a gene that turns on when you're learning, not when you're sitting down, you know, watching TV or whatever. So um, why some people make more or less, or, you know, are rats, or whatever, um, that's something that uh, that's what we're trying to figure out. But that's a very good question. So then uh, do humans have a Homer gene? Absolutely. Like I said, I mean, we've, um, we've looked at uh, levels of expression in hippocampal tissue from uh, disease patients and we, we, can, we can see all the different isoforms. And that's why the study in rats is relevant to human uh, disease. And so is it possible to stimulate the COVID environment in rat experiments when everybody suffers? From environmental and whether if we simulate the rats after a gallop, do you really will show some improvement? Um, oh, so I think okay. So I, if I understand this question right, you're asking that because of COVID, we were actually not environmental enriched, right? It was the opposite. We were deprived, and that what if after two years of being deprived, uh, we can uh, then do this enrichment and then get the same improvement. And uh, I say yes, because like I said, I mean, these rats that, that we've tested, the, these ex environmental enrichment experiments, they lived in a cage for 24 months in a, this little cage with another friend, uh, totally bored to death, you know, doing nothing. And uh, just, you know, they might have a little tunnel like, you know, to sleep in and maybe some nested materials. So when we do the enrichment for just one month, uh, we use like really significant uh, improvements. 
So yes, like I said, uh, it's never too late. So uh, I don't think the crowd who's uh, listening to this is has a problem because it seems that you guys are keeping your minds very engaged. So I wouldn't worry about any of you. So, uh, and I don't see any more questions in the chat. Any so questions? I'd like to ask then, um, do you know, does the field or do you know, is there a difference between, for example, a physical learning, like learning to play the piano um, versus intellectual learning, um, say learning a new language that doesn't involve um, major muscle groups. Certainly if you're speaking the language it involves speaking. Um, do you know, is there a difference observed yet in the impact of those two different approaches? Well, I would have to say that that learning piano involves also intellectual oh, yeah. uh, learning. But uh, let's say, for example, let's let's talk about maybe um, learning a video game where you need dexterity. You know, it's like a motor yep. thing or whatever. So actually, there's this uh, researcher here at the university, um, Sean Green, and he actually studies that. So he's basically um, trying to improve motor skills. Uh, by using uh, these particular video games. And what he finds is actually these, uh, he can improve motor skills, but for, just for this particular thing, it won't improve motor skills for other things. It's very specific. Yeah, that's what I was wondering about. Um, what do you call that card game that you play by yourself? Um, solitaire. Solitaire. Uh-huh. And... Uh, Thank you for grinning, Via. That's good. <laughs> um, I took that up for a couple of years, and I thought, "Wow, I got better at this, better at this." And I, but I have no idea if it helped me on any other things. Yeah, and uh, there's this guy in California who's developed this one. It's called Neuro Razor, and actually, that apparently, uh, besides motor skills or whatever, it also develops, you know, brain function. So it's like a car thing, but. Um, yeah. I think you have to, uh, there's something where you have to use other parts of the brain that just the motor parts where you have to figure out, you know, and improvise and things like that, so. And then uh, Lisa, if you'd like to ask the question you're asking me on direct message, that'd be great. Um, otherwise you can contact uh, Dr. Berger directly. Okay, here's more questions. So how could yeah. a recent UWBS of neurobiology graduate learn more about my lab? Um, so, um, so undergraduates, um, they, so undergraduate students, uh, they usually um, can sign up for um, like, taking credits. So for example, there's this bio 152, so they can uh, learn about research. And so it's a semester where uh, they either join a lab or they just do a paper and, you know, learn about the uh, scientific method. Um, but most students or they can do independent research. And so basically what they do is they just, uh, if they're interested in neuroscience, they just look at the neuroscience training program and they look for uh, professors who do research and they just contact them. So I usually, the way I do this is people, uh, students contact me and then, it, I mean, right now, for example, my lab is full. I have like six undergrad students, but um, they contact me and then they tell me what their interest is, how long, you know, how many hours they want for credits or work in the lab. And uh, depending on, you know, if I see that they're really interested in my research and you can tell by, you know, if it's like a standard letter that they send to everybody in the department or whatever, um, then you're like, sure, I have time, I have, you know, space. And um, so that's one of the great things about UW is that is undergraduate research. I mean, the students have a lot, a lot of, of possibilities to, to get um, research experience. And you just basically what you do is you just contact the, uh, the researcher based, you know, you just look at their page and you're like, oh my God, yeah, they're studying, you know how lizards regenerate their tails. I'm really interested in that. And so you just say, hey, I would love to work on that. And so that's how it works. So, you know, very, uh, very system. And then uh, there's other people who actually, you know, in my case, 
I just hire the students for credit. And after a while, if they're really good and whatever, you know, sometimes I might just uh, hire them and, and pay them. And so some, some other uh, professors, they just hire students and for pay. So now uh, have you looked at aging in track order trails? No, I haven't. And actually, um, you know, um, odor is, is the most ancestral kind of memory thing. I mean, it's just, we remember odors bring out like memories more than, than anything else, but no, no, I haven't done that. Um, we, uh, we use some tasks where uh, what you do is you put different orders. And so depending on the, the order, so for example, I put strawberry and then I put, I don't know, chocolate and then I put vanilla. And then uh, the animal has to learn that where I put the vanilla, there's a pellet of food underneath. And so that's like, it's called an order uh, recognition task. And I don't do it in my lab, but it's something that uh, it's, it's a great task. I don't know if that's what were you asking, but. Um, And I think that's what I see right now. I don't see any more, but in the yep. chat. Any other uh, questions? I have a question. Let her go, Raj. Uh, what you have done with rats and your conclusion concerning environmental enrichment, uh, can we use this methodology to help uh, younger children who have got learning disability or does it apply there where we can provide based on your research and your work? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, like I said, we also did this experiment in young rats. And so again, you know, rats are usually in a cage, two of them, so basically they have no stimulation. And uh, with these young rats, actually it was kind of interesting with, uh, with the young rats, we needed a longer uh, enrichment time so we needed four months whereas with the old rats we only need one month so but absolutely and it's been shown i mean uh you know uh children in orphanages where they're left in their you know beds and that they don't get any kind of stimulation they they show like uh, cognitive impairments but uh, the the other thing is it, it depends you know i mean there's there's also like a critical developmental period so you know um if, if it's been an, like an ex extreme care, you know, um, extreme type of uh, deprivation is kind of hard to reverse it, especially if it happened like early during development. So, you know, like, you know, if they're babies and they have been deprived, then if you try to rescue that when they're like three or four years old, it's, it's very hard because the brain was developing and then didn't get to make all those connections that I was showing before because, and so then it's kind of hard to, to make those. The, the brain becomes, uh, becomes less plastic as you, you know, develop. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Okay. Any other questions? I have another question. Go sure. ahead. Uh, I don't know what I'm asking makes sense or not. Is there anything comparable to like a kidney transplant and other transplants? Is it possible we could take a donor GNA, which is healthy, and implant it via injection or whatever you do into a sick person who is lacking the gene, which is responsible for his uh, learning impairment or he doesn't have uh, environmental enrichment. Is there anything like that that's possible or yeah, I mean, does that, it make that, sense? Yeah, yeah, that's what's done with gene therapy. So, so let's say, I mean, right now this is too early, but let's say that, you know, I, I learn more about how Homer works and um, we start to do translational studies, um, you know, I mean, this is never going to happen, but uh, let's imagine that then we figure out that if we, if I inject uh, Homer 1C DNA like I do in the rats in humans, that they can actually learn faster or, or something like that. So basically, yes, through gene therapy, uh, you can do that. Um, 
uh, right now people are doing that, for example, in terms of Parkinson's is uh, during using stem cell um, transplants of, you know, uh, healthy DNA that doesn't have any mutations for Parkinson's disease. And so actually there was actually one of uh, the researchers, two researchers here at the University of Wisconsin, they just published um, a nature medicine paper where they've shown that they can take uh, fibroblasts from a uh, non-human primate and then make it, turn it into a neuron and then implant it into the brain of a Parkinsonian uh, non-human primates and they'll uh, start making dopamine and, and everything like that. So all kinds of crazy things like that, yes, are happening. Thank you, Raj. Any other questions? What do you see as the next step in your research work that will lead to some practical solution for people suffering from, say, uh, Alzheimer's or dementia or uh, people uh, uh, who are lonely, whom we want to get out and make them have an enrichment uh, sort of a therapy. Uh, so what do you see your research work leading into some practical application, say within the next three years or so? Okay, three years, that's very quick. <laughs> uh, so basically the next step, uh, what we're doing is like I've shown that, you know, um, you know, if you're an old rat and I do enrichment, you're gonna get better and all this stuff. Uh, what I want to do is how early, you know, like what, ha what changes are happening during the lifespan and what differences are versus, you know, with someone who's enriched versus someone is not enriched. So let's say you start young and then you have someone who's living in a deprived environment and someone who's in an enriched report. What are the changes that are happening at the DNA level, at the protein level, at the uh, imaging level. So uh, we're looking actually at the structural. So we're doing MRI and PET scanning of animals and we're following them through life and seeing, you know, someone is in reach one, you know, since they're young or, you know, they only one month, two months, six months, two years, you know, et cetera. And then um, we're able to see if, uh, what we're hoping to see is that the changes at these uh, synapses. So basically an enriched synapse will be fatter and bigger and we can see that by PET uh, imaging. So then what we're uh, going to do is that then take um, humans with different degrees of um, educational attainment and see if we see the same differences. And so then that would say, well, you know, what we see in the rats is applicable to humans. And so then we can find exactly what is the, you know, the pill that um, we can give someone to, you know, uh, prevent um, cognitive impairment associated with aging. So basically, if we understand what's happened, like the differences that are happening at the molecular level and how important it is to start early or late, uh, then uh, we can, like I said, uh, because I mean, not everybody can have the ability to go and then get a college education or whatever. So, you know, if we have the, you know, some other treatment um, that would be uh, great. There's, there's a really cool study uh, that they've done in uh, Baltimore where they take in retired people. And uh, what they've done is that they made them uh, go to schools and help children uh, read. So they go and read and uh, teach them how to read. And what they found with those uh, people is that their cognitive ability and their brain imaging and everything, I mean, their, their brains are plumpier and everything is, uh, you know, based on that enrichment, which is just simply, you know, uh, doing this exercise of just, uh, first of all, going outside so they're not isolated and then interact with younger kids and um, doing the intellectual thing of, of uh, teaching them how to read. So there's a lot of um, interventions that they don't need like medicine or whatever, right? 
that uh, so those those are the kinds of things that I'm looking forward to. Karina, how uh, Karina, how far down? Well, I shouldn't say down. What other animals um, show this kind of cognitive rebound? How what other model organisms might there be in addition to rats? Um, well, I mean, I've, I mean, it's been done in rodents and I mean, actually, so actually this is, this is an end of one, but um, I have a dog who has uh, starting to show signs of sundowning, which is, I don't know if you guys have, I mean, this is what happens when you get Alzheimer's as the day goes down, they start having uh, shows of anxiety and, you know, uh, dementia. And so my dog is, is having those issues. And so now I'm, I'm getting him like engaged in, I mean, the problem is that my dog is on top of that is blind. So it's kind of hard to do, you know, like having play with things, but I'm um, getting him engaged into, you know, um, I give him a bone and he gets upset and then he has to bury it and then I take it away. And so what I've sh I actually seen, He's changed from spending the whole night um, bouncing around the house and being crazy to just sleep overnight and then uh, showing uh, better cognitive ability. So, um, but in terms, I, I mean, this is it's also been done in non-human um, uh, non primates. I'm trying to low, uh, to think lower in the scale, like in terms of like fruit flies and things like that, but um, I don't know that anybody's done that, that, that low, I mean, that. And, and anything in like zebrafish or another vertebrate? Yeah, no, that's, that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. I just, I'm not familiar. I mean, I, uh, when I first, um, when I went, when I started grad school uh, in Colorado, there was a guy who studied with goldfish. And so uh, the way they, but this was a motor learning. So basically what they did is that they would put um like a floating like a cork and in their you know tied up to their bellies and so the the animal would go belly up and so he would have to learn how to swim upside down wow and <laughs> and so they were looking at the the genes of you know learning a memory or whatever and so um i was to i was supposed to find the homologous gene in mice because I think I forgot what was the name of the gene. I think it was called Ependum and I forgot. I mean, it was a long time ago, but anyway, so they found this gene was like highly upregulated and when animals learn this, there. And so, um, but I never found the homologue in mice. And so I think what happens is uh, some of the genes are just, they never made it into the evolution thing or, you know, they change so much that there's really not like a conserved Gene. Great. Uh, and then there's uh, one more in the chat from Sandy. Oh, wow. That's, that's a very, very uh, important question. Can you state uh, for the... Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. So following up on Raj's questions, how will your research um, affect uh, public health policy? Um, so I, I am lucky to be in a program where we actually have, so we have a graduate degree in um, neuroscience and public policy. And so I'm hoping that the, the people working in that area will help me with this. But um, I would just, you know, I would hope that my, my studies will show that uh, we need to put more, um, emphasis on, you know, engaging uh, the aging population into, you know, just be more, you know, less isolated. And uh, I mean, I know the, some horrible conditions with where some, um, you know, people are living in, in retiring homes where they never leave their room and, and things like that, or, you know, so I'm hoping that yeah, showing how important environmental enrichment is in, in order to slow down and prevent the causes of cognitive aging and dementia, 
that uh, this will be implemented. And is you know if if it's, if all you need is just to do little things to keep your mind busy, is it's cheaper than than drugs, pharmacological drugs. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you all. Someone said thank you very much for your research and your presentation. So, but thank yes. you for uh, you know listening um, at this late time of the day. So, well, you've been doing this at seven o'clock for quite a while. So, it's a little late. Good after dinner or before dinner. Um, I have a question. Sure. Okay, Raj, one more, and then we'll uh, shut her down. Go ahead, Raj. Uh, uh, you talked about experiment in rats and how to stimulate them and how to differentiate between rats that are smart and rats uh, that have got a learning impairment. But I didn't see any discussion on diet uh, that is uh, an important, that plays an important role in brain yeah. health. Yeah. Whether you change the diet of the rats so that they are not that active, they don't go after their treats as good as yeah. they do, they may make mistakes. And is there any experiments you have done to distinguish the effect of diet uh, in yeah. addition to the stimuli? Yeah, so, you know, it's, for example, when I did my environmental enrichment, a lot of people who do environmental enrichment, they put um, an exercise wheel and so I didn't do that because another factor is exercise. And so I wanted to make sure that that wasn't a confounding effect because a lot of people have shown the, you know, the effects of, of exercise. And uh, so diet, again, I mean, that's one thing that um, I, I need to get money because what I'm finding is, um, you know, my... I don't know what's going on, but uh, the rats, when I think is here, something in the vivarium, but uh, with the diet that they usually get, they, they die earlier. And I have like a lot of attrition because of that. So now I move them into a, 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 di a better diet. But um, yeah, the, I have a colleague who works on fragile X and diet. And so I am planning to collaborate with her because I'm actually, yeah, absolutely very interested in the effects of diet. In this case, these rats, uh, they're at libidum. So basically they can eat whatever, they can open the fridge anytime they want. And so I'm not doing any kind of restriction. Uh, but one thing is for sure is that um, I don't have the money to have an activity monitor in my cages, but what I do is I weight them every week. And so the, both the social and the environmental enriched rats are, um, you know, when I get them, they're, you know, 18 months old and they weigh 400 grams. I mean, they're like a small chihuahua. And uh, they, uh, um, just by, by being in those big cages and playing with the friends, they, they kind of, um, they lose a little weight. They lose like, you know, 50 grams and then they keep training. Whereas the other ones, the ones that are in the cage, they keep gaining weight. And so, but still, you know, both the social enriched and the environmental enriched, they both move the same. They have, you know, kind of like the same activity yet the, the ones with the toys and the intellectual um, stimulation, they, they do better. But yes, uh, you know, there's so many factors and in humans is just being so hard. Uh, and so now after these longitudinal studies and finally they develop these uh, biomarkers for uh, imaging they found that um, they've been looking at all these things, diet, exercise, everything. And what is, what is it? Because they thought, well, if you have plaques, beta amyloid plaques, you're screwed, you're gonna you know, have Alzheimer's. And they find that there's people with a lot of plaques and they're fine. They don't have any cognitive impairments. So they've looked at this, I mean, these are all over the world. I mean, there's studies where they're, they're, they're comparing and, um, they've looked at all these factors and the only common thing of people who are protected from having plaques and they're still preserving um, cognition was um, educational attainment. And so that's why I'm, try, I'm studying environmental enrichment because uh, we're trying to find out what is it that gives 
reserve and resilience to these humans uh, via, you know, education. And, you know, I don't mean education just going to college. I mean, if you are like a, like a airplane mechanic and you have to figure out how to fix things, I mean, that's uh, a lot of intellectual engagement and, and things like that. So yes, but but going back to the diet, yes, that's something that's in my mind. But you know, um, it's it, so what happened is you write a grant and you say, "Hey, I want to do that," and I said, "What do you know about nutrition?" And so actually, my colleague she had to get a master's in nutrition before they they gave her a grant. So I'm planning on collaborating with her. She already got the the degree, and so she she'll have the expertise, so uh, we can get funded. Very good. Well, thank you everyone for coming tonight. Thank you, Professor Berger, for giving the talk. And thanks, Bia, for all the help and keeping things running. Um, look forward to hearing you, having folks join us next week. Um, Paul Kelleher from Philosophy will be here talking about the ethics of vaccine allocation. So uh, thanks again to everybody, and thanks again, Professor.